Hello, everyone, and welcome to this month's Speaker Mind. Really happy to have you all here this morning or this afternoon, depending on where you are, to participate with us. And um, boy, it's really starting out 2022 as another tough year for our world, for everyone. And we've got this major crisis in the Ukraine. It's really hard to think about anything else. And I just wanted to obviously acknowledge it and uh, stand with the people of the Ukraine. Many of us know so many people, whether it's family, friends, or Ukrainians here in the US who are doing the best to help their country. We stand with them, men, women, children, everyone, in what they're fighting for. And really, at the end of the day, they're fighting for their equality, their rights as humans to be as a part of their country and continue with their identity. So honoring all of that, um, obviously we wanna take special time out for Women's History Month, which is now and uh, a weekend, and specifically salute the women and girls uh, from the Ukraine who are being, as I said, so courageous and brave during this incredible, incredible time. Um, and as they're fighting ferociously for their rights, we have a history in our country of fighting for rights as well. And I couldn't, couldn't be more excited and honored that Pamela Thomas Graham is here with us today to talk about what her life has been like in terms of her fight for not only equality for herself and her family, but for her colleagues and what she's been able to achieve and overcome in life. And I've had the absolute pleasure of getting to know Pamela over the last year and a half or so as we're colleagues on a board together and that board is Bumble. And Bumble as a mission, of course, stands for equality for women and girls all over the world. And Pamela and I not only share that passion, but are able to now put that passion to work in a commercial business, which is pretty wonderful to work and um, support a business that is really mission driven and makes decisions and is guided by those values to make business decisions. So Pamela, without further ado, welcome, welcome. So happy to have you. I've been looking forward to this for months. <laughs> me too, me too. And uh, it's been so much fun hearing about this program and um, being invited to participate. So thank you very much for the invitation. And it's been such a, a joy to be working alongside Elisa and our other uh, fellow board members at Bumble. And it's worth noting that it's a women founded and led company and the corporate board of directors is 70 plus percent female, which is not something that you see every day and certainly yeah. nothing that I've experienced in my professional life. So it's been, it's just been so much fun to have that, uh, to have that experience and to see what's the same and what's different um, when it's majority women who yeah, are. Yeah, that's right on. And with so, that said, um, I want to remind our Speaker Mind participants that we are always welcoming your questions. Um, as we go along, I have some questions for Pamela and I know some um, you know, key stories I'd like her to share with us for learnings of uh, for all of us. But please ask questions along the way. And if you've attended this program before, you know I try to get to as many as I can during the dialogue. We don't stick to a script. We want it, this to be a real authentic conversation. And Pamela is coming completely transparent, ready to share uh, anything we <laughs> want to talk about, which is exciting and always a good experience. So I have the chat bar open for those of you who do want to ask a question. But let's just get started with some of Pamela's background. So I have got a couple of things I want to point out. She's very humble. So let me just sort of give some key highlights of the things that she's done so that as we ask questions, we can have that as a backdrop. Um, Pamela, uh, as she grew up, um, and you'll hear that story in just one second, she was one of the first black women to attend Harvard University for law school. Unbelievable. We'll hear that story in just a second. And went on in life to do a number of first time only uh, black woman things. Um, like becoming the CEO of a major TV news network, uh, like becoming the CEO of her own founded business, like becoming you know, one of the key partners at one of the largest prestigious firms in the world for consulting practices, McKinsey and Company, and many, many other things. Um, so Pamela has had to um, stare 
face to face with obstacles and walls that said, no, you're not going in this direction. And she figured out how to go over, through, under, around. It doesn't really matter. But she made her future happen for herself and for her family. And we can all learn from that. So Pamela, I think what's probably the best thing for us to all hear is just a quick overview from your perspective of your background and particularly how your parents grew up, grew up and how that affected who you became because they grew up in a time um, very different from how we live today and would love to have our audience hear a little bit about that and your siblings. Absolutely. Well, thank you. So uh, I'll start at the beginning. I, I'm a Detroit native, uh, born and bred uh, in the Motor City and um, the reason my family was in Detroit is my parents uh, were both from the South. They actually met in college in South Carolina. Um, they were both the first generation of their families to go to college. They met in chemistry lab, which we always used to tease them about. <laughs> and um, they came North because my uh, auntie was already there. So they never worked in the auto industry, but, uh, but they ended up in Detroit. And I have one older brother, uh, Vincent, and he's a couple years older than me. And I think what Elisa is uh, alluding to is that I, I always say that I think my dad in particular was one of the first feminists <laughs> that, that maybe would have been so vocal about it. Um, Cause as a father, he never ever sort of made any differentiation between me and my brother. He always expected exactly the same things, uh, which was a lot. <laughs> he had, he worked really hard. He had very high standards. He was reading books all the time and everything. And, and he expected the same thing from us. My mom uh, always loved culture. So she was a social worker and she had her own work and her own income always. Uh, she never stayed at home with us, but she loved music and she loved art. So I kind of got all of that from her. And I think the combination of those two influences were that both my brother and I had a, just a real sense of conviction around the importance of social justice and social equity yeah. and hard work and education and reading and you know all of those things and I was really lucky because both my parents uh, had big dreams for me and I was able to uh, fulfill at least some of them. Um, and, and, and so your parents had this huge impact on who you became as a woman and as a human that didn't necessarily mean that you would have the motivation to be this, you know, badass business leader. Um, you know, you could have gone in several noble directions with that, but you went in this direction. Tell us about that. What motivated you and what motivates you today um, to excel in business and to lead teams and run companies? Well, so when I was growing up, neither of my parents worked in a for-profit environment. They both worked for the government. My mother was a social worker. My dad worked for the city of Detroit. And so I had no understanding at a visceral level of what it meant to work in a business of any size. And I always wanted to be a lawyer because I was growing up in the late 60s, early 70s. And my parents were always talking about Thurgood Marshall and you know, the civil rights movement and a lot of the icons of the civil rights movement were lawyers. And so my brother and I both wanted to be lawyers and my uh -huh. brother actually is a lawyer. So uh, when I got to Harvard undergraduate, I thought I was going to be a government major and that I was going to go to law school. I took one economics class and I just loved it. I really, something just clicked for me. And so I ended up being an economics major and my thesis advisor, who was a great economics professor, said to me, you know, there's no possibility that you're going to be a lawyer. But I was like, no, 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 I have to go to law school. I want to be Thurgood Marshall. You know? Yeah, yeah. So, so he's like, let me just tell you about this joint program, because I think you need to go to business school. And if you have to get the law school itch scratched, go ahead. But you, I just I guarantee you, you're not going to be a lawyer. So I ended up doing the JD MBA at Harvard. And I remember telling my parents, so how do you guys feel about, you know, four years of graduate school tuition? Yeah. And they were like, if you can get in, we'll find a way to pay for it. So God bless them for that. So I ended up going from Harvard College into Harvard Law and Business School. And as my professor predicted, I spent a summer at a law firm and didn't love it. And then I spent a summer at Goldman Sachs and a summer at consulting. And I, I loved both of those for different reasons. So when I graduated, I went to McKinsey in New York. And, okay, so um, so pause, okay, because we got to go back <laughs> for a second. These kinds of stories are what we learn from. You're in Detroit, you're going to high school in Detroit, mm -hmm. and you decide you 
want to go to Harvard Law School. And I'm, I think many people decide that in many cities around the world, men, women, black, white, all sorts of people. But the chances of getting in are minuscule. So tell us about like what motivated you. you I know you, um, you were just maniacally focused on that. Tell us the story of how that happened for you, how you made that happen for you. Well, as I said, so both of my parents, I think, had high standards. I was also blessed because we were pretty active in my church. We were Presbyterian growing up. And one of the women at my church had gone to Radcliffe in the 50s. And somehow she took an interest in me and said, you know, if you really want to think about going to a school like that someday, you should just come along to some of these orientation events. So she started bringing me to them when I was in fifth grade <laughs> because they would just have these things every fall for people in the state of Michigan to come and just learn about the application process and stuff. So I started doing that long before um, I had to apply, which was probably a good thing because I. Um, when it was time for my senior year and time for me to apply, I went to my guidance counselor at my high school and I said, I want to apply to Harvard. And she was like, what? Nobody at my little parochial school had ever applied to Harvard. So she didn't even know sort of what that involved. And then she's just like, you're wasting time. Like, why are you going to bother? This is crazy. So you had, Nate, you had a very close person to you, a naysayer. Didn't know anything Very about influential it. Yeah. authority uh -huh. figure who was a naysayer. And uh -huh. I was just lucky because on one side I had her, which, you know, just total skepticism and being dismissive. But I had my mom, my dad, and this lady from my church. And they were all like, we can do this. We don't need the guidance counselor. Okay. <laughs> so, okay. so I applied um, early action. And I remember the day that the letter came because I was, you know, at school and I came home and my father and my mother were both at the dining room table and they looked kind of serious. And I was like, what's, what's happening? And they're like, well, the letter is here. And I was like, oh dear, you know, is it thick? Is it thin? I didn't even remember back then, like was it thick, good or bad or whatever. But at any rate, they're like, sit down, you know, the letter's here. And of course my dad had already opened it. <laughs> oh my Lord. Okay. So, thankfully it was good news, right? I was like, if there's all this drama and then it all ends in tears, this is really not going to be good. But anyway, so it was a happy, happy envelope. And, um, and, and but it was, was like a whole family thing. And it's funny, I still have that letter and it just became like this talisman of, you know, just like your dreams coming true and you, yeah. know, you have really work for something and then having it work out which doesn't happen and I don't take that lightly at all doesn't happen all that often so it was so, so you know it strikes me to ask you what the themes are that you have lived and lived through you know you rattled off you know really prestigious financial services firms and you worked at a law firm and you were a black woman getting into Harvard law school double major in business and you know that had never happened before so what are some of the themes that, you know, we can learn from you on what you encountered across all of these opportunities when you were the, the first? And then, you know, we'll talk about CNBC because I think that's also uniquely different during a time of crisis like 9-11. Mm -hmm. But just as, as the one and only, what was that like for you and how did you handle it? Yeah, so I think a lot of people have been in that situation where they're the first and or the only, and some of the things that you feel that are challenging are you feel incre you see you feel either invisible or you feel like completely under a spotlight. Uh, so one uh -huh. of the things I've noticed is that. So as a black woman, let's just say at McKinsey, where there just really weren't very many anywhere in the firm when I was there. So I was frequently in a situation where I felt in, invisible in the sense that many times people thought that I was the secretary for the team when I was actually mm. the person, like the most senior person in the room. And they would think that I was there to like take notes or, you know, back in those days, make copies or whatever. Um, I always wondered, like, can they see me? Am I invisible? You know, they don't know any other black women except maybe their housekeeper or their nanny or something. So they just don't. Yeah, they don't see me. Right. But then on the other hand, you feel like everyone's watching because they think you can't do what it is that you're being asked to do because no one's done it before. So at that time, I, mean, I was a young black woman and I was giving advice to CEOs, most of whom are older and white and male. And I think people just didn't know, like, would those people take advice, business advice from someone like me? And what what ended up happening was sort of funny, actually, is that because they didn't view me as a threat, I was actually able to tell them some harder messages. Like, 
like when the when the white male consultants would talk to the white male CEOs, it was sort of like this, you know, who's smarter and who's who's the alpha. Whereas if I had to do it, I would just be like, hey, look, you know, I'm just I'm observing this and you should think about that. And they could hear it differently, I think, because they didn't they didn't view me as someone that was no. trying to one up them. And so right. I just use that to my advantage. It's like that old thing about, you know, judo, you just like use their strength as your pivot point, right? Take your perceived weakness and make it into a strength. And so I just realized that I could actually speak truth to people and they could hear it and they could see me. Um, and I just started doing that more. And did you, um, you know, you started at, it didn't matter which firm, like whether it was McKinsey or, 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 or you know, Credit Suisse, you were at Credit Suisse for a while. It didn't, doesn't matter what company, but as you got more matured and started pursuing even larger roles and responsibilities, what did you look for? Or did you just go where that job was that you wanted? Did you look for certain organizational values? I mean, you are an incredible voice uh, at the Bumble board. I know, yeah, I mean, I'm not in the boardroom at Peloton, but I'm sure that you're an incredible voice there as well. And, and, you know, around organizational values and mission and what's the right thing to do. Did you look for that in your career or did you just bring who you were to whatever company it was? Tell us a little bit about that. Because I think as women in our careers, we're always sort of fighting the where we think we'll be happy versus where we can excel. They're not always the same. Yeah, no, I think that's an excellent point. And I, what I try to say to people is, be very picky about who you will work for. Not so much the company in its totality, but for sure your individual boss. Just be really picky about that. And I always say to people, and I know how hard it is, but I won't actually, I would never like take a job with a boss that I couldn't talk about race with because I don't know if it's just me, but I, I find that a lot of people are able to talk about gender um, cause they all know a woman, right? Right. Right. <laughs> they don't all know a black person. They definitely don't all have a black friend. And sometimes they can't even say the word black because it just feels like a third rail. So if they can't do that for me during the interview process at some point, then I kind of feel like if you can't do that now, you're not going to be able to do that when stuff happens because stuff will happen. It always happens. And I need to know that you as the boss, the supervisor, whatever, are going to be able to talk to me about it, yeah. right? Like, so, so that I think is, it, it just takes a certain amount of courage, but at the same time, better that you show that courage before you take the job, because it's just sort of a guarantee in life that something's going to happen, right? Like I, I think I told you this story when I was a consultant at McKinsey, I was like a second or third year, maybe not even third. And someone used the N word in a meeting in front of me. We were just having a business meeting and the person just was talking about something related to automotive and he used the N-word and he just kept going like he hadn't said anything untoward. And your world stopped. And I'm sure and I hope I, other people you know, in the and room. And I was sort of stopped. like, yeah. Well, you know, what, what am I supposed to do? Do I stop the meeting dead in its tracks? Do I, you know, never say anything about it? You know, what do I do? And so I basically decided like, let the meeting end. And then I immediately called him over and I said, Hey, 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 I got to talk to you for a minute. I said, I don't know if you realize, cause I know you didn't grow up in America, but that word is just loaded and offensive and dangerous and wrong. You can, you can never use that word. And he was like, Oh, I, I didn't know. So I kind of, you know, talked mm. him through it a little bit. And at the end he said, well, thank you for not embarrassing me in front of everyone. And I certainly never heard him use that word again. I like to yeah. believe he never used it again, but it was just in that moment that it's sort of like, you want to stand up for yourself. You want to stand up for your family and everything you believe in, but at the same time, you want to be effective. So I thought, how do I, how can yeah. I be effective at getting this message to this person without, without doing it in a way that kind of undermines the effort for the firm and you know for me as a professional right so and these are spontaneous of, decisions right yeah. it's happening right in front of you your world yeah. stops your heart stops what's the right thing to do maybe there isn't an answer to the exact right thing to do but you did what was right that you felt at the time and you affected somebody 
you affected somebody and you affected others in terms of how they would do that in the future. But those are moments too that you take with you, right? How many years ago and you still remember it so vividly? Oh, I remember it like it was yesterday. People people didn't use that word microaggression back then. But yeah. that's kind of, I mean, this wasn't really micro, it was macro, but you know, just little stuff like like people would literally hand me a sheet of papers and be like, oh, could you please, you know, take this to the copier? And I'm like, I'm the partner on this engagement. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> you know what I mean? It's like, there's nothing FYI. wrong with being yeah. the assistant, but I'm not the assistant, right? And why are you assuming that I'm an assistant? So I think all of us in different ways, we've all had those moments where some people might say, well, that's just a small thing. You just have to shrug it off. But you remember those things because they diminish you and they question your competence and your sense of yourself and how other people are perceiving you it just it gets in your head and i think that's what people don't always always appreciate but no, like, oh, hard here if you can't get a cab or something it's like well yeah. it matters if i can't get a cab in new york that of that course. that gets in my head and affects me all day you know yeah yeah so so hard question um that we didn't talk about but it just pops to me of so in those moments one of them you described to us, but I'm sure we could be on, you know, in this program for hours. You could tell us other stories of things that happen, macro and micro. Then versus now, do you feel more supported? More, is there more awareness? How much further, you know, we have a long way to go. Like, how would you give us our culture and where, how you interact with our culture every day? Are we better? I would like, I would like to say that I'm not convinced that we, the collective, we are better. I was reading a book, fabulous book that you should read if anyone likes kind of reading history. It's called Traveling Black, and it's about how buses, train cars, uh, gas stations, all of these things that affect transportation in America were all the the flashpoints for civil rights because your freedom to move around right is the thing right that they can take from you if you look different so i was reading this book just two months ago and it just struck me my parents grew up in that era where they couldn't ride in the front of the bus like they grew up in the south riding in the back of the bus you know taking a train north they would have had to be in the black car and it's, it was the rules it was like and shockingly that, and, and, the rules and so what is astounding to me is when you read it, it's like you hear the stories from your parents, but when you read it, it's like, oh my God, like how on earth did they get over that? So for me, I have this flame inside of me that's kind of like, my people have done so much more. Like what I'm being asked to do is not as hard as what they've already done. You know, like nobody's gonna hit me with a nightstick, right? Like I, I'm, I'm gonna be physically okay, right? Yeah. Which, wow. which back in the day was not the case, you right. know? I mean, right. people are still alive who were beaten by, you know, police in the South because they were black. So, so I kind of feel like, okay, so when I have a situation, I have to put it in the context of, hey, okay, I'm standing on the shoulders of people who went through right. a whole lot more. Yep. If yeah. they could do that, I can certainly handle this board meeting, you know? So, and, so, yeah, I get it. And it's all relative. At the same time, we have a long way to go. And by the way, for everyone who's interested in the book that um, Pamela shouted out, uh, Michelle put it in the chat. So go ahead and grab that. Excellent so, book. So written by a Black this, woman, by the way. <laughs> yeah, right on, right on. Um, a speaker mind um, uh, team member. Um, so, so Pamela, I want to ask you um, about becoming the CEO of CNBC. Um, and I want to ask you about it not only because it's phenomenal that you um, uh, had that position because it's so influential in the world. I mean, it's media. So it's so influential on how people think. And I, I kind of have a two-part question for you. Um, one is, as a Black woman in that seat, did you have a, a, a view on how to deliver news that was what what you would say sort of to influence how people what people learned and what they saw in the media can you share like how, what that was like for you in making decisions uh when the time came of how news was portrayed that's part one and part two which you may weave into it is you became the ceo of this network just i don't remember how many weeks but just a handful of weeks before the 9-11 crisis yeah. and the decisions that were now in your lap of how to deliver news to the yeah. world is 
sort of mind boggling, um, you know, that emoticon, like it's kind of crazy. So mm -hmm. just tell us a bit about that, what you learned, what we can take from it. So I would say I do believe representation is extremely important and it's still not where you would want it to be even in business news, right? So when I came to CNBC, they had a lot of women. So Maria Bartiromo was there and Sue Herrera was there. And there were a number of sort of, you know, frontline anchor people who were female, but none of them were of color. And at that time there were no men of color doing major roles as anchor people. There are a lot of reporters, but there weren't people in the yeah. anchor seat. And right. the anchor seat's the authority seat. You sure. know, like, so I kind of quietly set out to just look for talent in places that maybe people hadn't seen it or bring people to the fore that hadn't had that opportunity. So um, Michelle Caruso Cabrera was the first woman of color who had an anchor seat. And I was the one who made that happen. And, you know, Carl Quintanilla and and Becky Quick and a few other people, you know, they came from the Wall Street Journal, but we kind of shone a light on them and said, hey, yeah. you know. So bigger, more visible. So find the, find the people that are already there and really develop them and give them yeah. a chance, give them a platform and let them show what they can do. I think that's extremely important. And, and frankly, just holding the line and saying, okay, we have a lot of, you know, iconic women at the network, but let's make sure we keep them and let's yeah. make sure that, that they thrive and, and continue to succeed here. And it's hard because, um, you know, a network is a network. It's a web of people. You don't just point your finger and say, do this. And everybody scurries around doing what you ask them to do. It's still a lot about influencing and it's about attracting talent, keeping the talent sort of with their heads in the game, et cetera. And it's, it's challenging. And then when you've layered on 9-11, that was just an incredible experience for me because I was still a young, parent at that point I had a two-year-old child and I had just become the CEO of the television network six weeks before it happened and so I was at 30 Rock when when it happened and it was one of those weird things where half your brain is like I have to get home to my child and my yeah. husband and the other half your brain is like where is my staff <laughs> like are yeah. they alive you know yeah. we had people working downtown on the stock exchange floor and thank god they were all fine in the end but i mean hours went by and we we couldn't reach them and you know it was just it was just unbelievable moment right for all of us for a lot of different reasons but as a young ceo <laughs> that yeah was, that was a that was a thing that was a moment that um you just find yourself having to dig deep and i think that's funny because when you talk about the ukraine and, and sort of the current situation right Another book reco is uh, there's a book called um, The Splendid and the Vile, and it's about the London Blitz. Yeah. It's about how Winston Churchill kind of got everyone in London to live through that and keep the spirits high and never give up and not, you know, appease, you know, the Germans or whatever. I think when you're in those moments of crisis, if you're lucky, right, you've been training your whole life for that, basically like everything that you've learned and observed and cared about, those are the things that come forward when it's go time. <laughs> and, so and, and, so, of... and so you talked about, and, and, and rightly so, and, you know, on a different level, I think some of us can think of moments of, you know, your, your family or your children or your brother or your sister or your staff and the safety and is everyone okay? That comes first. And then Mike, how did you balance that with this incredible responsibility to deliver the news? Well, so the good thing is- Right now, in the love, middle of this night. Yeah. Well, news people love a good crisis, right? That's what they kind of live for. So the ironic thing was, it wasn't so much like, how are we keeping the news on the air? It was frankly, how are we going to keep these people safe? Because they all want to go running back into danger. You know, it's like the opposite of what you might think. Yeah. Because that's kind of, you know, they live for the story, right? Yeah. So- so if anything, it was kind of like, it was like, let's, let's be prudent and let's not, you know, let's not do crazy things because it was really, it was a blow that it was at the heart of the United States, the heart of New York, but it was also the heart of the financial right. industry. And that's what we covered, right? So people had very, very strong emotions, even separate from the physical kind of damage. 
there were just a lot of strong emotions. We have to show them that, you know, we're the center of finance. We can come back. We can do this. And everybody had all this nervous excess energy and some of it didn't even have a place to go. So it was just, yeah, it's just an That's interesting a, moment. That's just a huge wow. So, you know, thanks for sharing that. A um, couple of, I'm going to take a little break um, and, and ask you a couple of questions that came in on the chat. And then I, okay. I want to move to understanding how you then founded your own company after working for these, you know, big institutions, but we'll, we'll save that for a second. Um, and and uh, Lauren's asking this question. I definitely struggle with opting for effectiveness because you mentioned about, you know, and being effective um, and often tend to show my reactive emotions first. Any tips for how to communicate to your peers and leadership, especially on DEI topics that you obviously could become emotional about? Yeah, it's a good question. Um, and it is, it's hard because I have experienced that pretty much every job I've had. Um, but probably even the most recently is when I was at Credit Suisse, I, I had human resources as part of my portfolio. And so I had, you know, perfect window into how people are evaluated, yeah. and how they get paid and how they're treated if they've done something, if there's an infraction, you know, and and it's sort of like, yeah, when you're really there and you can see that if you weren't in the room, maybe things would be going differently. It can get emotional because you you do have to be composed. You don't have credibility in some of those situations unless you're composed. And I think that's the, the thing to try to keep focused on is it's absolutely okay to be frustrated, to cry, to be angry, to vent, but just you can't do that in real time. And you can't do it in front of people who aren't like that, right? So and I do was you think there's a Do you think there's a double standard? Do you think when crisis or things happen where men get upset in the boardroom or show emotions as a CEO and want something to happen and maybe use emotions to lead, do you think there's a double standard on that or, or, oh, or yeah. not? Oh, yeah. <laughs> Sadly, Yes, I think it's very difficult for for women to lead with emotion. Yeah, I don't think that a lot of people give us permission to do that. Yeah. I think for women of color, the extra layer is we also aren't ever allowed to be angry about anything because everyone's just waiting around to say, yeah. angry black woman, you know? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> so yeah. even if you have a righteous indignation or anger about something, you still have to play it cool. You know, well, so. I think you gave a great word for us all to sort of think about in terms of effectiveness, which is composure. Because yes. composure is something that you work at. Mm -hmm. It's not, it, you know, composure is that you are getting it together and that you are planfully kind of creating your presence. And I really, I really like that because our natural reaction may not be com viewed as composure. Yes. And so keep your composure, use your composure as a way to be effective and then of course, okay, to yell, scream, cry. Yeah, <laughs> out, after out the fight of the right. moment. Yeah, absolutely. That's why you gotta have friends and family members and exercise and meditation, all of the things that help us deal with the feelings that we have. But you have to just think about it, I guess, as being like on stage. It's like when yeah. you're on stage, you don't sneeze, you don't cry, yeah. you don't miss your lines. If you trip, you just get up and act like nothing happened. That's right. kind of where you got to get your head to be because that really is a lot of business life. It's it's performative. It just is. And you have Well, to I think it also... Um, creates a um, human nature of yourself that allows more people to be more transparent with you because they've seen you through crisis and they've seen you keep your composure, make decisions, act confidently. They're going to bring stuff to you more than the next person who tends yeah. to wig out, yes. um, which means that you can be more sure. effective yes. because you have more information. Yes. Um, and it's true to also, I say this to my kids all the time. It's like, just remember that really the, the civil rights agenda only wins if you continue to progress in your career, right? Like if you, you know, have yeah. a blow up, you, you could be right in that moment, but let's play the long game. Yeah. Right? You know, like winning in the long run is figuring out how to do this in a way that allows you to keep. Right. Rising yeah, and, and, and you become burning. the shoulders for the next exactly. for the next generation. Um, so here's what I think is a question that is um, awkward and difficult for people to ask. Um, but I bet 
others are thinking of it. And um, one of our speaker mind um, attendees is asking it. Do you think complexion has played a part in your acceptance in the boardroom? I'm asking as a fellow light skinned black woman. Mm. Yeah, colorism is, is definitely still a topic in, in, in our community and others, right? So um, I honestly can't answer that because mm -hmm. I don't, it's, you can't really prove a negative, right? Like I don't have any data points to say that if I look different, that my experience would be different. Yeah. I can tell you that some of the people I went to business school with who are still my very close friends have had very successful careers as bankers, as consultants, and as senior executives. And they're not light-skinned, they're dark-skinned Black women. And they have been able, in their way, right, to occupy a space that allows them to rise. Yeah. So I don't discount the fact that for some people, it probably is easier, I guess, for them if I'm I have to look like this and not like something else, but but that's kind of on them, you know, because well, it is I an always, interesting. Yeah, I announce myself as being black because I don't want people to be confused, right? Like, like I don't want them to wonder. I just tell them, you know, you yeah. have to experience me as a black woman. And if you don't see that, then let me just point that out to you. Uh -huh. And that's how we move forward from that point. Yeah. And, you know, I don't know. I, but I think it's okay. a good question and I but don't really... Oh, okay, so so that's interesting. So from a um, a fellow light skinned black woman, w one of the tactics you've used is to say, as a black woman, yes. Before, so I think that's a really interesting piece of advice. Like, don't let anybody guess. Right, because I didn't appreciate it, but then I it kind of dawned on me after a while that some people actually didn't know because yeah. I'm like how do they not know? But it's like, well, they don't, you know, yeah. <laughs> they're not sure. And they don't know if you, you know, do you want to claim that or not? So I just take that right off the table. And I do think that's probably helpful. Really, really good tactical piece of advice, but for everyone, thank you for that. So moving into kind of your current stage of your career, um, you founded and became the CEO of a company um, called Dandelion Chandelier, right? Um, <laughs> <laughs> and I know it, I know it promotes and supports, you know, wellness and using um, advanced technology and having an effective life and also luxury experiences. What, what's that about for you? <laughs> and, and what kind of, um, you know, what can you share with us about the motivation to develop this company at this time in your life? So I was lucky that by the time I left Credit Suisse, I kind of had enough, um, economic resources that I didn't have to go and take another corporate job. And I really wanted um, to just prove just literally just to myself that I could start something from scratch and make it into something meaningful, particularly yeah. as, as a marketer, because, you know, I had been the chief marketing officer at Credit Suisse and I'd been spending a lot of time my entire career around consumer brands, but they were always inherited consumer brands. So like I ran the Liz Claiborne brand and I ran CNBC and I, I had a bunch of brands. They were uh, already known to people. They were already there, yeah. right? They, they, they had been there in some cases, you know, I was on the board of Clorox, you know, the company's like 150 years old. So there's only so much you're going to do with a brand that someone else has already built, right? right. You can do little stuff around the edges, but you're not going to change it fundamentally. And I just thought, you know, like, well, what if I just make up a brand and then try to make it mean something? <laughs> and yeah. let me just be like, what would that be like? Where, where would I go with that? So um, we came up with the name Dandelion Chandelier because there was a museum exhibit in London called The Future of Luxury. And one of the works of art was a literal dandelion chandelier. It was a chandelier made out of actual little oh. dandelion, little fluff. Um, and it was just this beautiful, incredibly complex thing because it had this industrial infrastructure. It was made of like wrought iron. And so the inside of it was like handmade by people but then the outside was like this very natural delicate thing and i just loved the juxtaposition of those and i thought there's a lot you could do with that so because in many ways you know that's that's what life is it's that friction between the the rough and the hard and the dreamy and the grounded and i i liked that imagery so we, that's where the name came from and then our tagline is see luxury in a new light and it's basically to say that luxury is for every person it's not for 
people of particular size, gender, background, whatever, um, that luxury can be free. It doesn't have to be a gazillion million dollars. We call them micro luxuries, but like a really, really nice, you know, bottle of jam in the morning with your English muffin. That's a, that's the luxury, you know? So we try to cover the big, the little and everything in between. And it's been fun because as a woman of color, a lot of the people on our staff are also women of color. They're not all, okay. yeah. but, you know, just about everyone's female and many are of color, not black, uh, but other of color. And it's just been really good because we do in many ways love luxury, just like everyone else, but we care a lot more about like, where is this coming from? Like, yeah. How is it made? Where was it made? You know, is this person authentic? You know, is this a real brand or is this sort of just a fake, right? So we shine a light on a lot of entrepreneurs of all backgrounds and products that come from a lot of different places. But the spirit of it is to say, if, if new luxury, if modern luxury is for everyone, then let's do the work of finding all yeah. of those opportunities wherever they may be. Well, it's pretty cool to think about like luxury, which is all about enjoyment, um, being inclusive and not being um, of a certain economic status, but really enjoying luxury in the way that you can and having access to it. Yes. Um, one of the things that you told me um, about yourself that I think is somewhat related to being the C CEO of, of this, um, of Dandelion Chandelier, um, but also throughout your life is that you love to write. Yes. How does writing come into your life as it relates to not all these big business jobs, but thinking about accessibility, thinking about, you know, the things you want to write about and that you write as a hobby. Um, tell us about that part of your personality, the creative side. Yeah. So thanks for asking. Um, I've always been a bookworm. I always have my nose in a book reading. And when I was at McKinsey, I for some reason decided that was the moment I wanted to write a book. <laughs> so okay, I so it was up, early on. <laughs> yeah. So I was probably five years into my career at McKinsey and I, I loved reading mystery novels on airplanes and stuff. So I was like, I'm going to write a mystery novel and the heroine's going to be a black woman. So I wrote this, uh, <laughs> I wrote a series called the Ivy league mystery series and I published three books. So one was set at Harvard, one was set at Yale, one was set at Princeton, and the heroine of it is a black woman uh, economics professor. Fictional? Fictional and woman fictional, based course, on someone yes. you knew. Uh, no, fictional, okay. but um, but just because at that time, you know, now we kind of take it more for granted that the black woman can be the romantic love interest or the yeah. object of desire. But at that time, there weren't that many fictional characters that weren't either overly sexualized or abused or whatever, right? right? So I like, let me just create a character who is definitely black and owns that, but is also, you know, she likes clothes and she yeah. likes to flirt and she's at Harvard and, you know, she can be a lot of different things. And yeah. so it was really great fun for me. So I did that before my kids were all born. I finished the third book just as my twins were arriving and I haven't written a book since then. But when I started Dandelion Chandelier, one of the big drivers was also that I get to write every day. And I really do love that. I love, um, I love the act of writing, but I also like the way it makes me engage in the world because like, I'm much more focused on like great museum exhibit. Got to go do that. Cover that. Yeah. Dandelion Chandelier, or, you know, what's happening, you know, in London this week, or it just keeps you engaged in the world in a, in a really cool, interesting way. So, so if you, if you've, um, you may have found a few new fans on this uh, call today. <laughs> so if we want to follow you and we want to read what you write, what would, what would we do? Where would we go? Well, it's super easy. It's, it's www.dandelionchandelier.com. And we have a newsletter that comes out four times a week. So you can subscribe and then you'll hear from me four times a week. Yeah, that's pretty cool. <laughs> that's pretty cool. Well, I agree with Pamela. Pamela said you really lit up when you were talking about writing and the creative outlet it provides you. And I noticed that too. You really love that. <laughs> and, and that's super cool. I'm sure that had yeah. a big I impact on your business roles too, to be creative right. and think out of the box of. I think everybody has 
some part of them that is truly interested in creating something and it can be wildly different, but you've got to nourish that part of your spirit. I think it's really important. You know, it's like, I used to think I've got to work, work, work. And then at some point in my life, I'll have, you know, that yeah. side. And then I, I realized pretty quickly, like no time, like the present to yeah. just live the life you've been wanting, you know, so and not to do not- it in an irresponsible way. Like I didn't quit my job and go, you know, right. But I just did it. I just made it work. I just right. got less sleep. You know? <laughs> well, it gets to your point of, you know, we kind of get defined as someone, a black woman, a white woman, a whatever, whatever the mm-hmm. adjective is. And it sort of leads on who you are. And there's so many different facets to all of us that yes. you, I think you've laid out a way, even in these powerful, big, high responsibility jobs and becoming a mom over the course of the years, you know, to feed your soul as well. And what are those yeah. things that light you up? Make sure you spend time on those. Make sure you have that level of um, kind of differentiation in mm-hmm. how you spend your time and you become more, 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 um, you know, balanced that way as a human. Yeah. So as we wrap up and get to um, sort of the, the, the close of the hour, um, one of the things we like to do with our speaker mind discussions and particularly our incredible guests like yourself is to get some practical advice. And you've given us some tips along the way of things that you've done and that, that you would advise others to do. Um, But two questions on um, very specific advice. The first question is a lot of the women, and we have men attend our calls too. Everyone is very welcome on these topics. We can't do it without men and women working together. Many of us work in a corporate environment and we do have all these other interests in our lives. And we just talked about that. But in that environment, when you are the only um, or or the first, you know, what are some things that you would advise us to do and maybe even break it out if you're a white woman or a non-white woman, right? Mm-hmm. A, a, a person of color, a woman of color. Are there things that we can do to accelerate the, the um, collaboration and effectiveness of the environment as we raise all of our goals on DEI? What's yeah. your personal advice to us? So I would say if you are kind of quote unquote the other, right, whether if you're the only woman or the only person of color, whatever that may be, I think you have to try to find ways to make it easy for people to talk about whatever the thing is that is making you the other, right? So like I spoke about the fact that a lot of people don't want to talk about race. So I just make them talk about it and I don't do it in a confrontational way, but I just say, you know, did you see this headline or what did you think about that thing? Or, you know, I was at my granny's house or what, you know, just bring it up in a way that's somewhat natural, but just like say, like, it's not, it, it's, it's not a third rail. It's something we have to just talk about just like every other thing we talk about. I think if you're not the other, if you're in the majority, whatever that majority may be, Little things make such a difference. I'll never forget when I was at Credit Suisse, I moved into my office in Zurich and my next door neighbor was this older Swiss gentleman. And I was like, this guy probably is like, what is this girl doing here? Or how is this going to work? And instead he came over and he's like, hey, you know, you're my new neighbor and I got you this book. And he, he gave me this book of quotes that was just, it was like a Swiss artist, sort of like a like an artist who did only words as part of his art. And it was just a little thing, but I will never forget how I thought, oh my God, like maybe this is going to be okay. You know, it was just such a small, friendly, just someone inviting me to lunch, you know, the first month that I was there, I will never forget how happy I was that, you know, this investment banker guy just invited me to lunch. Yeah, Didn't have to. So just little human friendly gestures. If you're in the majority, that, you'd be, you'd be amazed that something that to you, you just take for granted and you wouldn't even think of it as being a big gesture. That means a huge amount to people who feel like they're the other. Yeah. Well, you know, we never talked about this, but one of the things we always um, talk about with speaker mind is that micro actions have a macro effect. Yes. And, and it's really true because human to human, um, it matters a ton and in this context, we're, we're talking about, um, you know, the one or the first. And then there's also the larger context of just becoming allies of each other, you yes. know, regardless of your background. You know, when you have 
doors you can open for someone or information you can share with someone to help them um, move through something. It like makes all the difference in the world. It really each of does. Our and lives are macro yeah. to us. Yeah, you're so right. And I think sometimes even in the best situations with DEI, people keep thinking about what's the big gesture, the big change. Yeah. Really little stuff would make a huge difference, yeah. right? Like just finding ways, as you say, to get people to form little alliances, even if they're somewhat temporary, just in a conversation, just seeing each other, right? So like for me, when I became a parent, it became a lot easier for me to relate to people because anyone that has a kid, you can always talk about that, right? It's like my kid did this crazy thing or, you know, I can't believe I didn't get any sleep, whatever, you know, any parent yeah. can always, so whether it's you're a pet owner or you're a parent, you you like to run, whatever, like find something that is a little more universal. And the other thing that I did, which I, I hadn't done before, but at Credit Suisse, they were all so into sports and I had like zero, zero mm -hmm. interest in sports. Yeah, I've been there. Uh -huh. But I actually decided instead of like what I would normally do, which is just like zone out when they would talk about sports, I was like, you know what? I'm asking them to know my world. So I'm going to go try to know their world. So I actually joined their football pool and learned how to, you know, do these little friendly bets on the NFL. And then I learned a little more about the NBA. And so now I can like hold a reasonably intelligent conversation about sports. And that's only because I was surrounded by all these dudes and that's all I wanted to talk about. And I was like, I can either like meet them where they are and learn a little bit, or I can just kind of roll my eyes and yeah, not engage. And I just, you know, I took a different direction with them than I had prior. And I was sort of glad that I did that. Yeah, and I think that leads to um, really a second piece of advice you've given us, which is, yes, our own feelings and, and equity and being in the room matters, but it also matters to have that empathy to others. Yes. You know, some of the questions that were asked today, you know, what I think you've done, Pamela, which we take a lesson from, is you make the conversation okay, and you could have the best intended white man, the best intended white woman or anyone in between, but they're worried. They're don't, they're nervous. They don't know how to say it. If they say it wrong, will they be, yeah. you know, uh, labeled? And it's very, very hard. So I think, you know, for me, one of the biggest things I heard you say in every story today is, you know, make it okay to talk about it. Mm -hmm. Yes. For, for everyone. And then people will have good intentions will then participate in the conversation, which improves our environment. Yes. Yes. And I, you know, I was thinking also that, you know, there are some of us who have things that we feel are already public, right? Like most of us think that our race is already public, but yeah. like if you're an LGBTQ, maybe, maybe people don't know that about you. Right. right. Maybe you don't know always, do I want to disclose this at work or not? And I guess I would just say that I would hope for all of us that people would feel that they can bring all of themselves to work, right? that they can share that openly, they can talk about whatever, and that like we're colleagues, we're working together, we, you're here because we respect and trust. And I would hope that over time, whether it's something that's obvious or something that's not obvious that you have to self-disclose, that we would create environments where it's okay to talk about any. Yeah. Yep. Yep. And Renee just wrote about having to learn how to play golf because um, uh, she was in banking. And it's yeah. actually a great example. I was in sales early in my career, selling to a bunch of CIOs who were no, absolutely zero of them were female. And I was young. And how am I going to talk to these guys? Well, I took some golf lessons and I wasn't very good, but I was able to invite <laughs> them to get on the course and talk to me. So, you know, yeah. yes, sometimes we have to walk in others' shoes to, to participate. So, um, Pamela, you have been an awesome Speak Her Mind guest. We're so happy <laughs> to have you. you. Um, and thank you for everything that you shared with us today. Um, this is recorded and will be posted on our YouTube channel for, for others to participate who couldn't make it live. And a very, very, very heartfelt thank you for um, your transparency and um, just fun chatting with you today and sharing all your stories. Well, thank you, Elisa. And thanks to the entire team that put this together. I think one of the other great things about the speaker series is that you guys are all now in different places, but you've kept this bond and you've kept this program going. And 
I think that illustrates better than anything I've said, the power of alliances, the power of real relationships and how they can lift us all up. So, well, thanks for noting thank that. Yep, we're, we're, we decided to stick together. And, I and a, big, a big heartfelt thank you always to Namely for giving us the resources to put this on. And if you want to learn more about Namely, of course, we'd be delighted to do some follow up. Just take the poll on your screen. We'll see you actually next month. We have another fantastic guest coming up. Um, let us know if you want to attend and we'll be putting that out into the market in the next couple of weeks. So uh, thank you, Pamela. Thank you for everyone attending. Have a great day. Bye. And go out there and speak your mind. Yes. <laughs> Bye-bye.